Uh, well, now I have the honor of introducing our speaker this morning, Mo Bella, Moises Bella. Mo Bella's diverse career and experience uniquely position him at the epicenter of where law, politics, business, and finance intersect. Mr. Bella is the founding partner and CEO of the Bella Group LLC and Mo Bella LLC, global business development consulting firms with clients in the United States and Latin America. Through this venture, he brings an international network of high profile leaders and decision makers to his various clients. In addition to running his firm, Mr. Bella was previously of counsel at the law firm at Stain Mitchell, Beto and Misner, and a partner at the international law firm Holland and Knight. Mr. Vela's areas of experience include business development, public policy, public relations, government relations, regulatory affairs, management consulting, and Latino and LGBTQ advocacy. Also, he was formerly an adjunct professor at American University Washington College of Law. Mr. Bell is a longtime Washington insider. Mr. Bella's leadership and counsel have been sought by some of the country's top political and business leaders. Mr. Bella served in President Obama's administration as the Director of Administration and Senior Advisor in the office of Vice President Joe Biden. The stint was the second White House appointment for Mr. Bella, who served as Chief Financial Officer and Senior Advisor on Hispanic Affairs for Vice President Al Gore. Mr. Vela holds the distinction of being the first Hispanic American and gay American to serve twice in a senior executive role in the White House. A proud Texan, Mr. Vela earned his undergraduate degree at the University of Texas at Austin and his law degree from St. Mary's University School of Law. So with Without, he has multiple honors and is a member of the American Bar Association, State Bar of Texas, Unidos US, Hispanic National Bar Association, and NAACP. So, Mo, thank you so much for joining us this morning. The floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Angela. Uh, first, to, to the indomitable Angela Franco, you guys couldn't have a more incredible. Uh, leader. She is uh, my hermana, which is sister in Spanish, uh, a very dear friend. I have been a huge fan of hers. In fact, I think I'm the president of the Angela Franco fan club. So if anybody wants to join, just let me know. Uh, to Ajay, um, Ajay, my goodness, let me just tell you something. I just watching all of this and listening to your entire conference here, uh, I, I just, I regret that we haven't had a chance to, to work together, but I hope we find a way to do that. You clearly are an amazing, amazing leader, and there's something very genuine about your spirit. I can see why you were at the helm for two years. What a great, great guy. Uh, Dr. Rudd, my goodness gracious, I just want to jump through the screen and hug you. Like, there's an effervescence about you, and this, this, I just feel like, an optimism. As you spoke, I was just feeling this, this, er, this surge of energy and optimism and everything's going to be okay with Carolyn Rudd uh, at the chairmanship or chairwomanship. I, I don't like this sexism chairman thing. But anyway, uh, you know, and Heather, I have to fess up, Heather Ness. Uh, I got so excited and carried away with y'all's proceedings. I voted on your damn slate. I didn't, I, I unmuted and I'm like, yes. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not a member. Wait, wait, wait. So Heather, uh, do reflect on the record that you have one vote that was uh, probably, as Ajay said earlier, probably need to recount, okay? Or fraudulent. Do, sir. <laughs> a fraudulent vote, okay? There finally is a fraudulent vote. It was mine in this election. Um, and so, uh, and just before I get started on a couple of thoughts I wanna share with all of you, I just want to say to you, I was sitting here watching all of you and listening with, you were just inspiring me and just motivating me. And then I started looking in the camera and I have a point of personal privilege here to acknowledge a little egotism that happened momentarily while I was waiting to, to speak. I looked in the camera and realized, I kind of hope we get to do these things virtually for the rest of our lives because it really hides my quarantine fat belly 
And I just realized, you know what? I kind of like this chest up thing because no one can see how overweight I am. So that was my observation this morning. I just wanted to share that with all of you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so listen, let, let me be very clear. Um, I am not coming to you in any official capacity on behalf of the transition team, on behalf of the Biden campaign. Uh, I am not authorized to speak on their behalf. I am not a member of the transition team. What I am is Joe Biden's former senior advisor. I set up his office as vice president of the United States the first two years of uh, the Obama administration. Um, and uh, I consider he and Dr. Biden personal and close friends of mine. Uh, I am working closely with the transition team, as Ajay said earlier. Um, I converse with them on a daily basis. Uh, and so everything I share with you, I just want you to know is my opinion, is my prediction, my anticipation, based upon my relationship with the Bidens and my conversations with the transition team. I just wanted to be clear, I am not speaking on behalf of the transition team. Um, and so with that said, you know, as I heard Ajay and I heard Angela and I heard Dr. Rudd, uh, <clears throat> I was sitting here thinking to myself, you know what I feel, and by the way, to Marie Johns, who served with me in the Obama administration, congratulations on the Hero Award, Marie. It's good to see you again, although, albeit it's virtual. Um, I've been long admired your work, by the way. Um, so listen, I, I, I view this in a really different way than most people. I'm like, I'm tired of dwelling on the past. I really wanna, I really wanna, start the healing process that I think we all kind of need to go through, I feel. And I don't think, I don't, I don't want to speak on behalf of everybody because there are many people on this uh, virtual call that, or conference that, um, that, um, you know, that, that probably voted for Donald Trump or don't support Joe Biden. And, and I respect you for that. And I, that's part of our beautiful democracy. So I don't want to get into politics but I do want to talk about the fact that I'm tired of looking back. I want to look forward. And that's why I love everything I've heard today is you guys are really focused on moving forward. So I view Joe Biden's presidency as, to me, it look, feels like a new chapter in this incredible nonfiction book entitled The United States of America, right? I mean, it's, it, it feels like we're turning the page and we get to start a new chapter. And that's how I view uh, the president-elect and uh, vice president-elect uh, and their upcoming tenure. Uh, with a new chapter in a book, you, you know, depends on what book you're reading. Angela's romance novels, that's a different story, right? But, but with the United States of America book, right, I look at the new chapter in the following way, and I think this is what we can all expect from a Biden-Harris administration. Um, with it will come some new twists and turns, right? new plot lines, new challenges, new problems, but above all, new solutions. And for the members of the chamber, to me, what's exciting about this new chapter is it brings new opportunities, new opportunities for growth, new opportunities for collaboration, new opportunities for an infusion of new energy, right? New leadership. Uh, on the national level, the SBA administrator and all the other agencies that impact small businesses, uh, where Marie, of course, so incredibly served at SBA. Um, and so I'm really excited about this new chapter. And all I wanted to share was with you was a couple of thoughts on get excited with me. I love what you're about to do. And I think, Dr. Rudd, I can't wait to watch you uh, deliver on all those amazing objectives you outlined, uh, and, uh, and, and to the chamber members, um, it's a new day. It's a new day. The sun is going to rise again, and we are going to have an amazing four years. I can guarantee you that, and here's why I can guarantee you that, because I know Joe Biden, and I admire and love Kamala Harris, and here's why I believe this is going to be a phenomenal four years. If for no other reason, if for, if for no other reason, listen to this carefully, even if they didn't pass one new policy or got one new thing done, it will be four years of decency. It will be four years of inclusion. 
It will be four years of love and kindness and equality and a spirit of generosity. Okay, and those, in my humble opinion, are American values. Those are values of the District of Columbia. Those are the values of, I hope, the majority of Americans and all of us as human beings. And so for no other reason, the next four years are gonna be amazing because we are going to have those values, I think, that most of us cherish back in our daily lives, right? Instead of being called names, we're actually gonna be uplifted. We're gonna be raised up, right? And I, I wanna say, before I get into just a couple of more little details, um, I, I wanna say something that I've been saying in the media. I don't, I, I, I don't please don't take this out of context. I, I have no ego and I, I, Angela will tell you, I don't brag. I try never to brag about anything because my mom's 87 and she's still sitting on my shoulder and I swear to God, as a good Latina mom, she would take her sandal, we call that a chancla, in Spanish, she would take that chancla off and spank me and I'm 59 years old. So I can never be arrogant or have an ego, but I, I'm very proud to say, I've done over 530 media interviews all over the world in the last 11 months, advocating for my dear friend, Joe Biden. And what I can tell you is that what we see on the television is what we're going to get a man with an amazing heart, a man with an amazing spirit, an unconditional lover is what I call him, and an unconditional listener. He doesn't ask you what color you are, who you love, what, what gender you identify with, whether you have a disability, what, what your gen, you know. It, there are no questions asked with Joe Biden. He loves you first. And I watched him with my own eyes, I watched him and I experienced it with my, in my own life next to him as we traveled around the world together. And so I, I just wanted to share that personal anecdote that, that I cannot wait to have that presence again and that spirit again. So listen, people ask me in, the, in those 530 interviews all the time, can we really heal? Can we really bridge this divide? How much of the hatchet can we bury? Right, because I don't know about all of you, but as a gay and as a Latino, there are there, this hatchet's pretty damn big and it's very personal to me, right? Because I've been called all kinds of names that I never dreamed in my journey I would be called. For my African American brothers and sisters, I can't even begin to imagine how you feel. So many racist overtones that we thought that we had left behind uh, in our nation's history, but resurfaced. 74 million votes. That means we have to understand why these people voted for him. Um, and so I have begun my personal process of burying the hatchet. Okay, but you know why I'm going to bury the hatchet? Because Joe Biden genuinely believes that we can heal our nation. And the only way we're going to heal and bridge this divide um, and create that economic opportunity for all of you as members of the DC Chamber. The only way we're gonna do that is to find common ground, even with those who we don't agree with. And I learned that from Joe Biden. Let me quickly, quickly tell you an, a story. On my first trip, on his first foreign trip, on Air Force Two as Vice President, I got to accompany him to the country of Chile. And he was going to meet with the president of Chile. And they, because of this, I was a senior Hispanic on his staff. They took me because it was a Latino country. So I was like, okay, I, I volunteer. So I get on Air Force Two with Joe Biden and, and Dr. Biden was on the trip too. And we're all sitting around in this little sitting area on Air Force Two. And uh, President Obama had put forth some policy and some Republican uh, U.S. Senator had just trashed it and bashed it and denounced it and had begun that negative, toxic kind of reaction to, to our beloved President Obama. Uh, and so, of course, I just felt comfortable sitting there with all of them on Air Force Two, and I just started spewing out that blankety blank blank Republican senator, how dare him be against my beloved Barack Obama and our policy. What a horrible human being that senator is. And I'm going on and on calling this person names. And Joe Biden with his right hand grabbed my left forearm and he clasped my forearm. I'll never forget it all of my life. 
And he looked over at me and he said, Mo, you're wrong. I said, sir, I don't know how you can say that. This man has been saying ugly things about you and Barack Obama and our policy. And he said, you're wrong. That's my friend. We both love America. We just don't always agree on how to make her better. And that was a life altering moment for me that I learned from Joe Biden himself. He practices what he preaches. And I share that with you today because I don't want you to think I've lost my mind in burying the hatchet. I just know that I learned from Joe Biden that in order for us to create a better economy, a more inclusive economy, this thought of building it back better, the only way that the Biden-Harris administration can build it back better is to build consensus to build bridges, right, not walls, to heal this divide as best we can. And I contend and I project and I anticipate that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will do that through their policies, they will do it through their words, and they will do it through their deeds. And let me tell you what I mean by that. By policy, they have committed to build back better. What does that mean? In my opinion, it means that we're gonna have a more inclusive economy where it's not going to be about bringing people down. You don't have to punish people in order to raise people up. I think that's what we will see as they build back better. An economy where all of us, right, whether black, brown, yellow, pink, or white, whether male or female or not sure yet, right, whether who you love, whether you worship, none of these things will matter because they will create an economy where everybody will have a chance, where we will all have, as I say, I don't, I'm not a fan of affirmative action because it, it elicits such horrible negativity. I'm a fan of affirmative access. And I think that's what they mean when they say they're going to build back better. I think you can go to the bank on it. We will have a more inclusive, accessible economic opportunity for all of your businesses in every way they can through programs and initiatives and policies at every agency, including the Small Business Administration. Vaccines, I don't know about you, but it is at the very forefront of my mind. I have not gotten to hug my 87 year old beloved mother in over a year and I can't take it any longer. The thought that I can't hold her at Christmas it may be her last Christmas, it may be my last Christmas, and I can't stand the thought that we can't hug one another, all of us, okay? So this vaccine means more to, I think, all of us than we even realize ourselves, right, on a daily basis. I don't know about you, but I'm missing the human touch. I did re remember I did say I'm gay and Hispanic. That means I will hug you twice. So keep that in mind, I'm a double hugger. So listen, this vaccine, the challenge we all know, and I know that if anybody can do this, I was the deputy chief of staff to a man named Ron Klain in both of my White House tenures. He will now be the chief of staff to the president of the United States. There is no human being, and I mean this, there is no human being that I've ever worked with in 59 years or that I've ever known who is as brilliant and more prepared and equipped to be the chief of staff and to make sure that this vaccine gets to our folks, regardless of what corner of this country they live in, regardless of how much money they make, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their socioeconomic strata. He, Ron Klain, will lead a vaccine distribution. Uh, I, I am confident of it. I'm absolutely certain it will run flawlessly and it will reach all of our communities um, and I hope it happens sooner rather than later, but I have all the confidence in Ron Klain, in Joe Biden, and Kamala Harris, and the many friends that have been named to their staffs. They will get this vaccine distributed. I, I, I feel confident about that. I'm excited about that being around the bend. Lastly, on policy, I know that stimulus is on your minds. A lot of our businesses are going under um, God forbid any of yours are on the brink. I hope not. I pray that they are not. Uh, but we're losing businesses left and right, many of which will never return. 
which honestly chokes me up. That makes me very emotional because as Marie Johns will tell us all, as the de former deputy administrator of the SBA, this country is not about major corporations. The heartbeat and the backbone of this nation are small businesses. And as they're going under, there goes part of our heartbeat. That's part of the soul of America. And some of them may not return. So I can tell you this from my conversations with the Biden team and the Harris team, the transition team, and knowing Joe Biden, this will be one of the highest priorities you will see in this new administration. And that is to create an environment that fosters not only growth, but access to the capital necessary so that Latinas and African-American women and people with disabilities and LGBTQ uh, community members and anybody who wants to have a chance to start a new business, I think you're going to have an environment, unprecedented environment with access to capital and opportunities and initiatives that will make it conducive for us to start those businesses and try to now make up for the ones we're losing. Or I hope too that part of those programs will be to bring some of those folks back who work so hard, some of them for 30 years, mom and pop shops who have been struggling every day and waking up and going to their store or their shop or whatever their business was. And now it's gone because something they couldn't control and nobody was looking out for them. And it's disgraceful and we're better than that as a nation. So on stimulus, I can tell you this, the, you heard Joe Biden already, this $908 billion, Whenever it gets passed, I do believe something will get passed. I really do. And I'll tell you why, because it's the first time in four years we have a bipartisan group of senators who finally buried the hatchet, talk about burying the hatchet, who are sitting in a room together and saying, you know what, maybe we called each other names for the last four years, and maybe we were complicit on some things we shouldn't have been complicit on, and maybe we should have zipped it, but we didn't. But now let's come together, and they are, and I'm really, I'm, I'm very optimistic. When I saw that, I felt like we had hope. Because that's the only chance, and I learned that from Biden that day, he grasped my left forearm. We've got to find ways to work together, even with people who we don't agree with. Even who, people who don't share our ideological, philosophical, spiritual, or religious beliefs. We just have to. That's what a democracy is. Think about it. It, it. That's what a democracy is. And we've lost sight of that. So uh, we will see a stimulus. It is, I'm told by the Biden folks, it is the highest priority. I love that Joe Biden last week said, if this $908 billion stimulus, it doesn't, it's not perfect. And he's already announced that. It doesn't have everything he wants. What did he call it? A down payment. So I think right away we're going to see another stimulus led by a President Biden and a Vice President Harris. Doesn't that just sound great, by the way, Vice President Harris? Oh, my God. <laughs> um, by words was the second category, and then by deeds, and then I'm going to shut up, and I'd love to, if there's anybody that wants to have a conversation or ask any questions, I want to open it up for that if we have a few minutes left. By words, listen, from the, from the, man, the time the man was running for office, up until yesterday, by words, Joe Biden has demonstrated that he's genuinely and sincerely committed to bridging this horrible divide. I don't know about you guys, I'm tired of hating. Hate was never a part of my upbringing. Like my parents never, I mean, they taught us not to hate. Our God, whoever we believe in, the universe, the trees, Buddha, whatever, um, Allah, God, Jesus, it does, nobody teaches us to hate. And I'm tired of four years of feeling that hatred percolate, percolating in my soul. And so Joe Biden has shown us through every word he speaks that he really is going to fight for all Americans, whether they voted for him or not. And I don't know about all of you, but I encourage you to follow, go with me. Let's follow his lead. It's going to be okay. He's going to take us into these uncharted waters, and it, it's okay to heal. I think we have to give ourselves permission to heal. Um, and then through deeds, let me just quickly say this. 
Joe Biden, at the demand of Barack Obama, uh, I was there when this occurred. He asked him to head up the Recovery Act, the first year of Barack Obama's presidency. And so Joe Biden came back to the office. I was standing there when he came back and he called us all in a room. And he said, the president has asked me to lead the Recovery Act. And the reason I'm just saying this real quickly to you is because Joe Biden has engaged in the deeds. He has proven that he can take that, that Recovery Act. This is Recovery Act on steroids, right? This next stimulus package. We're talking a lot more money. We're talking a lot more challenging. Not only do you have the pandemic, but you have the economy in shambles. We've got businesses like all of yours that are every day you're working, waking up worried about whether you're going to make it one more day. Um, so the challenge is massive, but I bring up the Recovery Act because I watched Joe Biden lead that flawlessly. Flawlessly. I watched him take it from the minute that the President Obama told him to the end where we actually infused capital, we, we raised up small businesses, we, we, we uplifted communities through these infusions of capital, very similar to what we're going to have to do here in the stimulus, right? State and local aid, uh, hopefully checks, right? These checks where people can pay their mortgages and their rent, uh, these unemployment supplements, um, all of this is massive, but if anybody can do it, it's Joe Biden and Dad Um, I know Kamala Harris can do it. So I, I, I'm not worried about it at all. We're going to be in great hands through their deeds. They've shown they can do it. Uh, the other thing that I'll, I'll close with is another deed that they both have proven, both Senator Harris and, Vice, and President-elect Biden um, have proven that they can both, they both have the ability and I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that it's an incomparable and uncanny ability. They both have a gift. And that is to bring people together. And they, they both have this beautiful, beautiful knack to, to build consensus. And so I think what you're gonna see by the end of January, if not the first two weeks of February, just watch. And somebody call me and tell me if I was wrong. But how much you want to bet the very first thing you're going to start seeing is they're going to bring all stakeholders, even competing stakeholders, just watch. And they will bring uh, Black Lives Matter and community organizations with law enforcement, with sheriffs, with police departments. They're going to bring them all together in a room because the only way we're going to reform our, our uh incredibly unjust system right now is to bring all the stakeholders and the parties together. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris know how to do that. They've proven they can do that. That's what's needed. I'm going to shut up. Angela's giving me that look that only she can give, which is enough already. But I hope that you get the, the spirit of my, uh, my thoughts today is that we are about to embark on a beautiful new chapter in American history. We need to stick together. We need to stick together. Uh, but we also need to give our undying support to the new president and the new vice president, whether that's uh, through actions, through prayer, through just a virtual embrace. Uh, they deserve it. They need it. And uh, we're all in it together. So if there are any questions or anybody wants to argue with me or debate me on anything I said, just go at it. Mo, thank you so much. What an inspirational presentation, really. Um, I'm so blessed to call you my friend and I cannot thank you enough for really being with us this morning. There is a question here um, and the question is from Adam Robinson. If we don't take back the Senate, is there any path to DC statehood in a Biden administration? Oh, wow. <laughs> Do what, uh, I'm going to give you the, my, the, the unfiltered pragmatic Mo, which is the one that unfortunately tends to be the one on, that, that speaks without any filter. Um, look, never say never, my mama told me, right? Never say never. Uh, will it make it more difficult? Listen, the pragmatic and the reality, the pragmatic answer and the reality is it will make it extremely difficult. But, but Adam, Adam, I think it's a very great question because it goes back to something I said earlier. Um, 
it goes back to something I said about Joe Biden earlier. When I gave you that, that personal story on Air Force Two, think about that story as part of the answer. Because if there's anybody who, who's going to try, it's Joe Biden, because he has that gift. He connects with people. Some of those folks are his friends. They don't agree on a damn thing politically. They don't agree on a damn thing ideologically. But if there's anybody who can reach out and say, listen, enough is enough for the people of the District of Columbia. They pay their taxes and they don't have any representation. They don't even have a vote. This is absolutely absurd. I mean, if the premise is absurd, it is just absurd. And so if anybody can make the argument, and if there's anybody that has a chance at it, I, 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 I promise you it's Joe Biden. I, I, I mean that. I just, so the answer is, would not winning the Senate make it harder? Yes. But would Joe Biden still have a chance? Never count out the kid from Scranton. I've been saying that since September of 2019, when he was in fifth place, I remember I was on Yahoo Finance News Live, and they said, well, it looks like your old boss is gone. He had just lost three states. And I said into the camera, never count out the kid from Scranton. So Adam Robinson, don't count out the kid from Scranton. <laughs> DC statehood is always possible. And I, I promise, I think he's gonna fight for it and he won't give up. Well, well, that's great news because it sounds like what you're saying is that it will be a priority of his. Well, I, 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 I can't see how it wouldn't be a priority. I, you know, it's, it, how could it not at this point? I, I'm not kidding. I, to me, this is an issue that is a no brainer. Like I can't even imagine how anybody debates the other side, but you know, that's just me, right? But I, I can't, I, listen, I hope it will be a priority. And you know what matters here? All of us on this call, we've got to help them make it a priority. Amen. We've got to keep telling them so that it is a priority. We have to keep reminding them that it is a priority. It's our government, you guys. This is our country. So don't forget the basics of democracy here. We keep telling them it's a priority. Thank you. Anybody has any additional questions, please? I mean, one of the questions I want to ask you, and I know you have, you have touched over that a little, Mo, but is how can we support, I mean, how can we help as an organization? Well, several ways, obviously. One is, you know, one is there's such a power in what occurs at the local level. And I think what you're, one of the major differences you're going to see in a Biden-Harris White House is that they're going to be reaching out to you. I, I, I just feel very confident about this. So you're, I think that you guys call yourself the chamber of the future. I heard that and I love that so much. And the key, Angela, is that you and, and Dr. Rudd and members of your organization, you got to stay in touch with the Director of Public Engagement, Cedric Richmond at the White House, the new Director of Public Engagement, and, and Julie Chavez Rodriguez, right? And, and it, the key is developing relationships and staying in touch and staying on the radar screen of those people who are inside making uh, decisions so that you have a place at the table. That's the big difference between, in my opinion, between a Biden White House and any other White House, right? Is that a Biden and Harris White House, that, that remember I said the word inclusive. So you have to make sure that in the definition of inclusive, the DC chamber has their proper and appropriate place at the table. And if you need my help in introducing you to anybody, you just call on me and I will introduce you to anybody. But you don't need me. Dr. Rudd knows everybody. Ajay knows everybody. <laughs> Marie Johns, for God's sake, she probably has a room in the West Wing already. So, you know, you, you're in great shape, but if there's anything I can ever do to help or support the chamber or any member of the chamber, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I will help in any way I can, but it's about relationships, Angela. The answer is stay on their radar screen and take your place at the table. Don't ask for permission. Don't ask for permission. 
You've got a seat there. Take it. I almost went a little gay there, Dr. Rudd. I was like, girl, <laughs> take your place at the table. Yeah. Thank you before, so much. Before the other questions, Angela, I just want to say thanks to Mo. The energy that you brought, the optimism, and your ability to connect us and help the chamber get to the table are just so important. I've been receiving text messages during your presentation. This is so powerful. We just want to thank you so very, very much. And just as important is to thank Angela Franco for knocking this particular annual meeting out of the ballpark. Hey, Angela. Angela, thank you so very, very much. Um, our first virtual, and I think everyone is enjoying it. I'm keeping an eye on the number of people who are still on the platform. We have well over 125 still on the platform. That says a lot. So I want to thank both of you. And RJ, thank you again. Thank Madam you. Madam Chair, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, we're going to take one more qu quick one more question uh, before we close. Um, Pat, let's see. Um, is, uh, uh, Pat, would you like to ask your question? Or you want me to read it? Okay, let me let me read it. Um, that's, I'm sorry? I'm trying to find the mute, unmute button. Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead. The now, last question. I just, I, 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 I hear your point about um, getting back to normal and uh, the idea around tired of being hated, uh, tired of hating rather. I am, and, uh, as an African-American, I'm tired of being hated. hated. And so my question goes to, goes around justice. Do you think that um, President Biden will seek uh, an, an AG that shares his view that we should just bury the hatchet? Or do you think that um, that will not be uh, a criteria that he will have of an, uh, an attorney general to agree with him? Wow, what a great question, actually. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to even begin to uh, try to get into Joe Biden's head because I think that would be disrespectful to him. Um, and I would know where to begin, to be honest. I do know his values. Um, here's the deal. I don't think that Joe Biden is going to pick an attorney general uh, let me reverse that. I think Joe Biden's gonna pick an attorney general for different reasons. I think he's gonna pick an attorney general to bring back the independence of the Department of Justice to where it no longer is an attorney to the president or the White House, it's the American's attorney, American people's attorney. So to answer your question, um, uh, I, I think it's fair to say this, I, I, Joe Biden is such a, I'm going to use the word sensitive. He is a, he's a very self-aware, very sensitive man when it comes to understanding human dynamics. He has, as we all very well know, endured an enormous amount of grief and pain on his journey of life through the loss of loved ones and, and as we all know, the stories. Uh, unbearable loss in some instances. And so, Pat, to... to the only thing I can say about this is I'm not entirely sure Joe Biden would agree with me about quote unquote burying the hatchet. I think what, what he would understand is that, that you and I both are tired of being hated and we're tired of being called names and we're tired of being victimized because of who we are. And I understand that Joe Biden understands that, right? So when he goes to pick an attorney general, I don't think it'll be about who will bury the hatchet or how aggressive they're going to be. I think it's going to be with an understanding that he understands that the pain that many of us are experiencing uh, is very personal to you, to me, and so millions of other Americans for our own personal reasons, right? I hadn't been called a fag, just so you know, in 38 years. In 38 years, I hadn't been called a fag. And in the last four years, I've been called a fag four times. So I can't even imagine my black brothers and sisters because I saw with my own eyes and heard with my own ears some of the names that you've been called, right? 
and some of my Latino immigrant brothers and sisters. So I, let me just be clear. I don't think anybody is, I didn't mean to suggest that we're going to forget or that Joe Biden doesn't understand the hurt and the pain that we all feel. I'm not suggesting that we brush that aside. I didn't mean to imply that. I just know that healing is, I just think that if we don't find a way to heal, to be really blunt, Pat, we're the ones that suffer. The people who hate us, right? They'll just keep on hating. But we're the ones suffering because we're the ones in pain. So we've got to heal for our own. And that's how I view it. Many of you may disagree with me. But I've got to heal because I want my spiritual being to be healthy. I want my emotional being to be healthy. Does that make sense? That was a very strange answer to a question about an attorney general. But I just <laughs> wanted to, no, but I just wanted to be clear that it, I, I think that we're in an unprecedented time period about humanity. So when you pick an attorney general, it's a very different today than it might have been four or eight or 12 or 20 years ago because of what we've experienced. That's my point. Okay. It's, there's a lot of pain and I get it. And Joe Biden gets it. He knows pain. He knows grief. He knows this is not going to be easy for any of us. Well, Mo, thank you so much, really, on behalf of the organization. And, you know, for me, you're such a um, gift in my life. And I really want to thank you for these, for the words, for the inspiration, and really for what we want to build. That is the chamber of the future. And I, we know that the circumstances are not easy, but it's about how we move forward and really? how we make it better and how we help people. So thank you so much for those great reminders that we have to be at the table and we have to work together and for the incredible inspiration. So thank you.